probably actually easier to build a space elevator on the moon or on Mars. You know, there's there's much lower gravity, so the, the weight of the tether becomes much less of an issue. You're now listening to Space Forward Podcast. I'm Hussein Bukhari, your host. With me are Matthias Frenzel and Benjamin Shapiro. In this show, we attempt to break down complex ideas into digestible chunks and answer tough questions with perspectives from space scientists and enthusiasts. In this episode, we dive into alternative approaches to go around the rocket equation, highlighting an alternative solution, the space elevators, feasibility of space elevators, mechanics of space elevators, regulatory and policy challenges for this alternative solution. And we find out why our guest believes space elevators is the next revolution after rockets. Just one remark before we go into the episode, as it is our first episode, we had some problems with the microphone configuration, so apologies for that. Welcome to our inaugural episode and our first season of Space Forward Podcast. My name is Hussein Bukhari, and today we've got an amazing individual talking to us about even an amazing topic. I'd like to introduce Joshua Bernard Cooper, and our topic of discussion today will be space elevators. Josh, how's it going? Hey, Hussein. Uh, it's going well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Pleasure, pleasure. Happy, happy that you're here. Happy that you're talking to us today in our inaugural podcast. Uh, you know, why don't you, uh, why don't you give us a brief uh, summary about, you know, uh, what have you been up to, and why are we talking about space elevators today? So I am uh, an undergraduate student uh, currently doing a degree in physics and philosophy uh, as joint subjects. Uh, and I've previously interned with the International Space Elevator Consortium, uh, which are a body dedicated to research and development for space elevators. Uh, I've continued supporting them through some voluntary research. And uh, yeah, I'd just love to talk about space elevators, sort of share the ideas behind them, the principles, and uh, why we should be more excited about them. Excellent. Describe us what a, what a basic concept of a space elevator is. Okay, so I'll start with a bit of the physics. Um, and if you look at suspending an object, so uh, a good example is suspending a brick on Earth. If you, if you hold up the brick with a wire, then uh, you, know, you can draw your sort of Newton force diagram of the tension of the wire and the weight of the brick. Uh, but in a non-ideal case, then the wire isn't massless. So to get this tension to hold the brick up, you've also got to consider the weight of the wire uh, pulling down. If you then imagine suspending this brick from space, so you extend your wire all the way upwards into space, so you're holding it up there, then the mass of the wire is going to increase exponentially and it's going to snap and the brick is going to hit the ground. Um, in a sort of similar way, if you imagine uh, taking a cable and throwing it off of a cliff, uh, then as you hold the cable, it's going to get heavier and heavier and heavier until it's going to snap uh, because the weight of the cable uh, is in itself uh, going to be too much uh, for the cable to support. Now, um, to counteract this, we use centrifugal force, which I'm sure many people will have heard um, physics teachers call it fictitious, and it's a fake force, and it doesn't exist, which I suppose is technically true, um, but if you sort of solve uh, the, the force equations in a rotating reference frame, where uh, you're actually imagining that the thing at the end of the rope isn't spinning round, but is staying stationary, uh, then you'll see this force emerge. Um, and that is, in that reference frame, that is the force that's counteracting um, the, the centripetal force pulling it inwards. Uh, so you've got the tension pulling it inwards, but you've got the centrifugal force pulling it outwards. And in that sense, it stays at a constant distance uh, from the center of rotation. And it's the same kind of thing that works with a space elevator. The, the weight of the tether pulling it downwards is going to be counteracted by the fact that the top of the, the tether is spinning around the Earth at you know, seven to eight kilometers a second, um, which is going to be pulling it back outwards. Um, so that's going to balance. And in that sense, the, the space elevator is going to stand taut like you were uh, standing, spinning a rope around you. And that holds the space, space elevator up. Um, now you can imagine launching something from the top of this. If you, if you attach 
something to the bottom of the space elevator and you move it all the way up, as you go up, it's going to be moving faster at higher altitudes. So you imagine a record on a table or on a record deck. Um, then if you put something in the center of the record, the, the record obviously going at a, a constant uh, revolution rate, um, then something at the center of the record is not going to it's not going to move. It's going to stay at the center point that it, everything else is rotating about it. As you move it out further and further, it's going to be moving faster and faster uh, because it's got to cover a larger distance in the same time of a revolution. And if you put something at the top of the space elevator, it's going to be moving faster and faster uh, until it reaches you know, that max velocity of seven to eight kilometers a second. And from that, you can detach from the space elevator and, and push it into orbit. You've got all that uh, orbital velocity coming from just moving it up the rope instead of having to push it up with a rocket and accelerate it uh, both vertically and horizontally. Uh, you know, space elevators are such a novel idea. And, uh, you know, one of the first things that come to mind uh, when I think about space elevators uh, is, is science fiction. You know, what, why do we need space elevators? What's the, what's the point behind that? Yeah, I think I think sci-fi plays uh, a sort of big role in people's first impressions, and I think that sci-fi has done a lot to uh, perhaps popularize uh, the concept, uh, being in books by Arthur C. Clarke and uh, in a bunch of other works. Um, but sort of bringing it back to reality a bit, I, I think the need for them now more than ever is becoming apparent um, as we sort of move forward uh, with our development on and off planet. Uh, we're going to need much more sort of lift off capability uh, than we could really achieve with rockets alone uh, even with the developments of private companies like spacex and blue origin the the amount we're going to need to uh, lift into low earth orbit and beyond is is going to be so much i mean if you look at uh, mega projects like elon musk's supposed mars colony you know that he wants to transit millions of tons to the red planet or ideas for space solar power um, satellites or, or earth sunshades at Lagrange points or even stuff like nuclear waste disposal it's all going to need uh, so much more mass than we can currently get up there no absolutely I think yeah I think I think you hit it straight on point in terms of the requirement of mass and the delta V that's required for us to get the number of objects and number of uh, payloads up there but you no know, one it, the, 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 the question will always be, you know, novel innovations are, are so far-fetched uh, that a lot of people don't see uh, a realistic practical use for them. So what made you interested in space elevator programs? You know, what, what inspired you to get in there? So I think, I think what you say about a lot of people sort of don't see the practicality in them is, is an important issue to, to raise and an important one to address rather than, you know, just sort of bashing it and saying, oh, we should, you know, ignore the naysayers um, because you're going to face that with a lot of projects. And, and initially that that's the same kind of attitude you got with space stations or, or even going to the moon. And, and we're so far beyond those concepts now that we should really be looking forward on to onto the next things. And I think that's part of the sort of what drew me to the concepts and the ideas of the space elevator is that we, we need to be looking for these next steps. And, and the only way we can do that is by by thinking large and thinking big and, you know, sort of dreaming about what could potentially be possible. Yeah, I mean, thinking big is a, is a primer for you to become an engineer or a scientist. I mean, you have to be able to, um, you know, broaden the horizons of your mind and let the creativity and imagination go loose. You know, but the other aspect of uh, not being an engineer and not being a scientist is business. Uh, you know, how does a solution like a space elevator give us a, a cheap, uh, fast, a reliable, uh, beyond the beyond the carbon line? Yeah, so there is uh, quite quite an economic motive behind the space elevator, uh, as I'm sure you're aware. If you look at the rocket equation, the the amount of of mass that you'll be throwing away. I mean, even if you don't look at the equation, you just look at a rocket going off. You can uh, you can see your money burning before your eyes. Uh, there, the amount of money you spend to put uh, a small fraction of your launch mass into space, let alone somewhere on you know the moon, uh, it's huge. Um, 
So sort of the the initial motivation behind the space elevator were uh, these economic ones. You know, how much could we reduce the cost of putting a kilogram uh, in orbit to, you know, sub a hundred dollars or uh, sub fifty dollars or or maybe even less. Um, and these are the same kind of drives that move companies like SpaceX to look towards reusable vehicles uh, and reducing uh, costs towards, um, you know, putting their rockets back in space a second time. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is sort of what motivated uh, initial arguments for the space elevator. And it's still it's still a large part of why we might uh, want to look to it economically. Um, but I think there are other things that uh, the space elevator can achieve in a, in a business sense that are going to be more important. Maybe if you look towards the environment or, or, or other motivations of the current day. Yeah, I mean, there's a there, the motivations aren't any aren't decreasing, uh, but what is decreasing is the number of funding opportunities that you can get to evaluate and explore these type of these type of projects. You know, uh, historically, you know, these projects have been attached to science fiction for such a long time that it is beyond the idea uh, to even imagine that hey. Uh, space elevators, it's a possibility and they could potentially reduce the number of X, Y, Z. Historically, I'm sure that you know, uh, who came up with the idea first? The The original idea for the space elevator was uh, by Sokovsky, who, it's actually his rocket equation uh, that we talk about so much and he went to Paris and he, he saw the Eiffel Tower uh, and he looked at it and he thought about constructing a similar tower all the way up to the height of geostationary orbit. Um, and if, if you think about it that way, then the top of such a tower would be circling the Earth as if it were in geostationary orbit. Um, but of course, to do that kind of thing, you're looking at a structure, uh, it's what's called a compression structure. So sort of building something on top of each other and supporting its own weight that way, which would you know, be even more of a task than uh, the sort of tensile structure, which we look at now, kind of like a, a, a rope pulled taut, which first came about in the late 50s and the early 60s, um, where Artsutinov suggested sort of deploying a cable downward and a counterweight the other way from geostationary orbit. Um, and since then, it's been developing on this idea, you know, looking at material science and sort of how we can make something like this possible. And the International Space Elevator Consortium was actually founded in 2008. Uh, so they've been doing stuff since then. Well, that's excellent. You know, we know that uh, Bradley Edwards, uh, he published two books. Uh, the Space Elevators are revolutionary to, to transportation in 03. And then, you know, talking about leaving the planet in the space elevators, which I think sort of inspired quite a few movies from the Hollywood. Um, so realistically, Google X and NASA, they figuratively evaluated the space elevator. You know, what did, what, what did you, what did you think of the outcomes that they came up with? So uh, I'm not uh, massively up to date with the progress of Google X and NASA, but I know that Google X I think they ran into issues with looking at the material mainly, which is, it's always been the issue. It's been the issue of finding a material that um, has the tensile strength to, to withstand uh, the forces involved for a space elevator. Um, and that was, I think that was about seven years ago, but sort of the exponential rate of growth in, in technology and material science these days uh, means that things are always changing. Um, so, whether or not that evaluation is going to stand up for much longer could be debated. I know that NASA have run competitions um, looking at space elevator technology, looking at their climate competition uh, back in 2005, and they also ran a, uh, a tether challenge in 2012, uh, also with ISEC, actually. Um, so I think the, the motivations there, especially if you have players like Google and NASA looking into it, and what of the what of the consortium? What are some of the goals at the consortium, and how many elevators are are the goals? You know, what's the what's the time frame like that we should expect the first um, breaking of the ground of the space elevator? So, the ISEC has 
uh, an idea that sort of just goes beyond the individual space elevator, uh, sort of into something called the Galactic Harbor. Uh, that's what it's been termed in the research. And uh, each, you know, be uh, there's supposedly three galactic harbors, uh, each of which could consist of six elevators, and each elevator having seven climbers. Um, and of course, this would be something that comes uh, along way after you've got your your space elevators uh, up and going. It, it's much more of a sort of I think futuristic uh, aspiration. But once you've passed the challenges of getting an initial space elevator up, then I think the rest is. Um, I wouldn't say easier, uh, but you've you clearly overcome the main challenges if you get to that stage. Uh, in terms of time frame, I, I think it really just depends on when you know serious investment and dedication comes to the project. Uh, ISEC has sort of looked at, at saying, you know, if 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 we started in a capacity of sort of the level they want, then you could have initial capabilities by 2040 and maybe more full capabilities by 2050 which i think you know sounds quite soon but still i think 30 30 40 years is is quite a way off um so it would still be uh, quite a lengthy project so you're saying that it could potentially be in our lifetime that we could see the first space elevator in action i'd certainly hope so um but uh, of course, what that depends on is in our lifetime, do people see the business motivation for it and, and sort of see the desire to go for it? And that, so, so, so here's a question for you. You know, typically, as we see on Earth, uh, elevators company or companies are, are utilizing the, the, the resources to have a commercial, strictly commercial approach. Um, you know, how do you see the economics and the business case be made for for something like this? You know, and it's just, it's it's really close to me because at the end of the day, everybody wants to make money somehow as much as they want to be able to provide a a, a faster, cheaper, reliable product. Uh, you know, so what do you say? What do you say as a as a enthusiast? Should there be should there be aspects of making money involved in this? I think whether or not you you sort of want to look at it from a a higher moral perspective about access to space or whatever is that I think realistically the the business motivations and the economics of it are ultimately what would make a project like this reality so I think there do definitely need to be aspects of having businesses involved uh, and viewing the space elevator as an infrastructure project that is uh, in the long term going to save money and make money um, I think perhaps for a company or an organization looking for this motivation, it might be found in having uh, a, a dominance over traffic to space, um, being able to be uh, the sole offerer of uh, massive lift capabilities for these projects in low Earth orbit or for supplying uh, colonies on Mars. They'd uh, you know, instantly be uh, the most competitive option for anyone looking to transport large quantities up into space. You know, one of the things that boggles my mind is the the disconnect and and the larger players in attacking a revolutionary concept like space elevators and creating a business concept around rockets. You know, we see that people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, um, and many others have sort of undertaken the task of simplifying and easing rockets instead of tackling a more sustainable and perhaps a, uh, a little bit of a out there approach of establishing space elevators. Why do you think that they're not doing it? You know, what, what, what do you think that is preventing them from, from even dabbing into this? That's quite a difficult one. I think there, there could be multiple reasons why people will be put off in terms of putting in the, the time and the money. Um, like I said, maybe you know, 30, 40 years, that might be a time frame where someone like Elon Musk, who says he wants to die on Mars, might look at that and think, I'd rather get there faster. It might be motivated by wanting to build on technology that's been you know, strongly developed for the past 60 years, um, and really the step to reusable launch vehicles isn't, isn't as massive uh, as the step towards a space elevator, for example. Um, I suppose even for someone like Elon Musk or, or 
Jeff Bezos or someone else who has a lot of money under their belt or within their corporations is that it would still be such an investment and, and maybe maybe the motivation isn't there to weigh it off against our current use of space. Um, whereas maybe in 30, 40 years time, the, the use of space and the demands for space will be enough to uh, make a space elevator worthwhile. Maybe nowadays where we can quite easily uh, satisfy demands with rockets, that there's there's not the the justification for gearing a massive company towards it. Correct, correct. No, I think I think one of the things is, is building that demand, and I think the, as you mentioned, the demand isn't there, but also because you know the the the, the revolutionary concepts are not easier for you people to see because they're looking for the easier way out uh, or the faster way out, essentially, to get the biggest bang for their buck, right? Um, what do you think, you know, I, I always tap into this because um, I figure with anything business-related, one of the concepts that comes into play is regulations. Uh, you know, governments uh, have a tendency to establish and apply regulations in any means necessary. You know, they did that back in the internet days in order for it to not get too out of control. Uh, they're doing that now with the space and uh, 5G and some of the other things. What kind of framework do you see playing a great role in establishing uh, uh, an aspect like this? I can only say I'm not too sure. I, I think it would be impossible to have such a project without it becoming, uh, you know, of immense internationalist and sort of subject to international uh, regulations in that kind of way, um, especially if, as ISEC would want, it was uh, constructed somewhere out in the middle of the ocean. Um, then you have difficulties with, you know, currently if you launch a rocket, uh, those on that rocket um, and the payload that in space is, is under the jurisdiction or, or the sort of the... It's there to be looked after by the country which authorised the launch. Um, and now if you have this uh, gigantic national structure in the middle, of the, uh, then there's a lot more consideration uh, into who's in charge, who's responsible, and especially if you're launching more stuff from it, uh, then how that's going to be regulated. I I don't think there really exists the, the regulation at the moment to look into a structure like a space um, when I was doing my internship with ISEC and looking at um, uh, the balloon system, maybe sort of test some, some prototype technologies, uh, I, I had a, quite a bit of trouble looking through um, the FAA's regulations for, for tethered craft. Um, and there, there wasn't much there. It was a few paragraphs talking about tethered balloons um, because tethered balloons don't go very high. And this was a project looking at tethered balloons that could go up to 35 kilometers. Um, which would be a massive hazard to aircraft and things. So there really wasn't there really was stuff there for. I think there'd have to be a, a huge legal involvement. It, you know, it's 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 interesting that you say that because they haven't been able to develop a robust regulation or regulatory system to to have it attached to the market of in-orbit servicing or, or things like that, space tugs and space transportation. So I, I envision that they'll have a hard time. They'll definitely have a hard time establishing something along these lines because, you know, it's such a global, global initiative, as you say, and it, it requires an international sort of footprint. Um, and what we know about geopolitics as they are right now, international footprints sometimes seem to get really muddy uh, and out of scope. Um, you know, what... Let's come back to come back to something along the lines of where our, our listeners can brainstorm about. And I, I love doing this because uh, this uh, idea of crowdsourcing different ideas and bringing it to perspective could make it make this vision revolutionary concept into a reality you know what kind of design concepts do you see working best um that's one of the biggest things what do you think from your research and from your time at isec uh it would be appropriate here so in terms of designs for a space elevator or yeah design concepts for space elevators um so i think a lot of what comes down into Design concepts for space elevators would be the operation of a climber. 
Um, and I think this is one of the things that's captured me the most. Uh, it's sort of the dedication of researchers and people at ISEC to looking into how the climbers will work. Um, and there's sort of competing designs there. There's looking at sort of more traditional wheel based things that go up and down. Uh, but there you're going to run into lots of problems with friction and energy dissipation and the material's going to fatigue and you don't really want that on something like a space elevator. Um, looking more at like linear induction motors and, and things moving up and down it kind of like a maglev train. Uh, alternately, I think the leading idea is like an electrostatic wheel where the wheels are sort of constructed out of various almost like uh, capacitor plates that are angled with a potential difference put across them uh, and that you know causes a, a component of acceleration um, so I think that is quite a leading design in terms of space elevators uh, I think uh, another thing that in terms of design of space elevators that, that maybe you wouldn't initially come to mind is sort of how the tether would be uh, constructed and it wouldn't necessarily uh, be like a typical rope. It would be more of a, a sort of a thin ribbon with a, a varying thickness uh, as you go up and down. So to maintain uh, a constant tension and not uh, risk a breakage at one particular point. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it is a it's a dangerous it's a dangerous thing to think about. It's a dangerous concept, and I think um, as much as innovation there is. Uh, the innovation has to be dangerous for it to become better and better and better um, over time. And that's that's just iteration over iteration. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned is, uh, is, is ISEC. You know, it's an open science community. Um, how is it like to contribute to, to a community like, like this? And w can you give our listeners an idea as to how it works and, is it open to anybody? Do you have to go through a, um, a a very very harsh process? So I I wouldn't know anything about uh, a selection process for someone just uh, apply to help with research because having sort of done into I was able to uh, immediately appear with the environmental study, um, but from from my understanding of ISEC, it's it's very open. Um, to having people join and contribute, um, you know, members can contribute helping in in research primarily, um, dedicating their their time to doing that. More different academic fields, uh, from you know the highest doctors in uh, material science or systems engineering, all the way down to me, sort of like an undergraduate physicist level. Uh, people writing articles and newsletters and doing presentations at conferences and workshops to uh, sort of spread the good word as it were. Uh, but everyone's volunteers uh, and they depend on, you know, member contributions of, of effort and uh, funds as well. Um, so I think I think the mindset at ISEC is very much that everyone has something to contribute. Everyone has something they can learn from each other. And it's not like a, a top down structure of, OK, dogs, we've had this many years in the space industry. We're going to tell you what to do. It's 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 operative and you know, even working on this study is, uh, you know, I'm treated as like a, an equal partner writing my chapters with people who've, you know, done systems engineering for, for donkey's years. <laughs> that is indeed the concept. And this is what, this is a beautiful thing about um, an innovation, innovative driven group of people uh, that the, the focus has always been on, the focus will always be on on the topic itself and the innovation itself rather than, you know, the personalized versions of, of, of uh, egomaniac, maniacal type of behavior. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is what was, uh, you know, out of your internship, what was one key thing that you learned that you, know, you could share with, with us um, that, that you think that everybody should look out for or in their own manner? So more, more in the sense of uh, space elevators or cooperate well, just, in that kind of environment? Just, just uh, you know, uh, talk about space elevators a little bit because what I really want to know is uh, what kind of research was done around the, around the materials. And, uh, you know, I, what I wanted to know essentially is 
try to imagine in my head as to what it could look like and what you might have learned when you were there and you're like, wow, Zan, this is a cool concept and this will definitely be applicable in the next 30, 40 years. Yeah, I, I definitely think what you said about the materials is quite interesting. Um, and that will always be in the sort of public uh, discourse around whether or not a space elevator is possible. Uh, and I'm sure lots of people will have heard about doing space elevators with carbon nanotubes because uh, for a while they were one of the biggest candidates. Um, but there's been so many struggles to build carbon nanotubes of any sort of significant length. Uh, and so more recently, uh, single crystal graphene has become one of the leading candidates. And I was I was quite surprised reading about this because something I'd, I'd never heard of, sort of before I was at ISEC. Uh, and yet it's it's becoming such a, a leading material uh, for space elevators that p- potentially even in other industries, I'm sure it's going to have uh, plenty of applications. It's got this huge tensile strength and you can produce sheets that are like saran wrap or, or cling film or you know whatever kind of stretchy plastic you want to call it, uh, but it, insanely strong. Um, and the things that would be achievable with that kind of material. It's yeah. beyond, it's definitely it's definitely unimaginable at the moment, right? Because um, you know people are thinking about uh, how to utilize um, the, the the fiber cables currently and uh, use them in satellite applications. So I can only imagine if a if a uh, tenfold reduction of mass and um, volume is taken into place with new materials being innovative, I don't even, I can't even imagine what it might do because I lack that imagination. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, one of the things I'm sure that you figured out and I'm, and I'm sure that I think was really, really important in discovering was uh, the potential speeds of, uh, of, of the elevator because that's one of the key things that helps the, helps the rocket industry keep propelling is uh, no pun intended, but uh, it's the idea that uh, it'll take us less time. It's more efficient, you know. So, what are what are some of the things that you find about what are the speeds that an elevator could potentially uh, potentially move 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 into? So, I, I don't have an exact figure for how fast the tether is going to be moving, but I think that the the speed aspect of a space elevator that makes it appealing is, is not set necessarily in how fast the climb is going to be going but the fact that the climbers will be going like round the clock um and in that way you're able to you know have stuff going up into space daily have it sort of regularly um and you don't really have to worry as much about launch windows um because you aren't you know strung back by the limitations of the rockets um of course the climbers they'll be going fast but they won't be going as fast as rock on an individual basis um simply because the speeds at which you fire a rocket up are just insane uh, when you consider them on, on like a, a ground movement scale. Um, and that does introduce problems, of course. Um, the rockets absolutely uh, shoot through the Van Allen radiation belts, so anyone on board doesn't really get any sort of noticeable dosage of radiation. Uh, but if you're on something moving at the speed of a very fast car or a train, um, then you're going to be in the radiation belts for quite some time, uh, and that's quite risky. So, of course, you can either try and mitigate uh, the effects of the radiation or, uh, as ISEC are, are sort of more recently angling towards, is, is uh, you know, a dual space architecture. If You, you can still utilise rockets while having uh, the space elevator because um, there's going to be benefits to both. Uh, that's, that's, that's a great point. And I think safety is one of the key things that uh, each and every single innovation decides to capture itself into, you know. Um, back when rockets were first getting introduced, the number of failed launches that we saw, uh, especially from the United States, were critical in developing, you know, the Saturn V, and then moving on, developing, you know, larger and faster and cheaper rockets that are more safe. Uh, obviously, with 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 engineering, there comes downfalls. Um, you know, what are what are some of the challenges that that you see that this industry or this specific market segmentation or vertical, whatever you want to call it, we'll see, you know, what what are the concepts, what are the challenges here? So I think from a, an engineering perspective, some of the main challenges, obviously not only the material, but the dynamic involved and 
the tons and tons of complicated maths you've got to do to work out how a structure like of, of this scale and of this shape would would move. Um, you've got to consider the tether uh, as a as a rod trying to stabilize itself uh, along the gravity gradient, moving like a like a metronome, uh, oscillating naturally. Uh, the libration as well of the space elevator will be something to consider and all the different waves and vibrations you know transverse waves torsional waves compression waves i think there's actually a picture out there of one of the climbers at nasa's climate competition and it stops because the torsion waves on the tether became so great that the tor the, the tethers you know twisted on itself and the climber gets stuck um so these are uh, some of the main considerations uh, that are going to be difficult once uh, you know once the material's there and proven uh, it's making sure that a structure like that is kept in check uh, and it can be done you know like any other great engineering structure or, or a rocket like that it it may seem cha seem chaotic at first but with enough dedication it's uh it can be managed i'm sure I am sure it can be because I think with any challenge, there's a solution. You just gotta be, you just gotta be hard at it. Because if you if you're able to find that solution, then you've overcome that challenge. Um, you know, one one thing that I am sure our audience would want to know is um, the issue that is currently at hand of space debris and the amount of um, space debris that has been um, that has been introduced over the past. Uh, past years of space launches, uh, you know, I wonder if you guys have looked into the idea of what happens if the space elevator collapses, you know, and falls, uh, space debris, and you know, what are what are the some of the considerations there? Have you looked into this from an environmental standpoint? Yeah, definitely. I think I think first of all, uh, the space elevator in terms of debris is going to bring a huge advantage in that you're not chucking away loads of parts of rockets every year and you're going to save debris in that way um, but of course with the concern of should it collapse uh, it would definitely depend on where the elevator was severed um, if you imagine two people in a tug of war if if the rope breaks at one of their ends then it's going to ping back towards the other way or if it breaks then it's going to go either way so if it, it broke somewhere in the middle then some of the structure of the earth and the other part of it would you know, ping back up to the uh, apex anchor and stay in space. Uh, but if there was um, a sever at the apex anchor, then most of the structure would fall to earth and there would have to be um, procedures in place uh, uh, to to mitigate the, uh, the damage in such a situation. Um, and I'm not personally quite sure what they would be. Uh, I think there was discussion of maybe looking into um, a destruction of the tether in that scenario or, or getting people out of the uh, the area but of course in that situation it, it would it would take quite a while uh, for the tether to come back down to earth and come crashing down as much mass as it is it's got to go you know 36,000 kilometers through space um, so there, there should be out time to take action that's a great point because you know that kind of brings me up to my 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 next thought, which is, it depends on how it crashes, but it will also depend on where it's located. Um, you know, so geographically, have there been consideration as to what is the optimal place or what is a space elevator port um, and where it should be constructed? Uh, so yeah, the the space elevator or the galactic harbor would want to be built uh, in the ocean. Um, tether to the uh, platform there is is probably the most uh, viable option um, and equatorially as well uh, because you want to be building it up to geostationary orbit so I think the proposed location by ISEC were looking at um, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean as well as the Indian Ocean maybe uh, for the three supposed galactic harbors um, but yeah, in the ocean. So should should there be a dangerous scenario, I think that would hopefully minimize some of the damage. Yeah, definitely minimal minimal damages if if you're locating something in the ocean. But then you come down to the idea of, uh, you know, what what potentially 
what kind of resources will you need in order to actually house something like this? And that's you know that's a that's a topic of discussion for 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 a completely a completely different time. <laughs> uh, but I, what I wonder is that you know as much as we have un- we have been unable to figure out the depths of the ocean, uh, you know it's been a while since we've been back to the moon, uh, and uh, we don't know when we'll get to Mars. So what I wonder is, an uh, application like space elevator or a market of space elevator. Could it be feasible uh, to have a concept uh, that could be established on the moon first before we do anything on Earth? Is there a uh, is there a beta test that could be developed uh, on the on the moon or Mars because of gravity and and such? <laughs> it's it's <laughs> definitely possible, and it's probably actually easier to build a space elevator on the moon or on Mars. Um, you know, there's there's much lower gravity, so the the weight of the tether becomes much less of an issue. Uh, while maintaining the tensile strength of the material. Uh, and as a result, you need to do less research and development into a material that can withstand those kinds of weights. Um, so if you if you look on the moon, um, for example, such a structure would definitely help us uh, in getting to the surface of the moon uh, and sort of reduce the cost of getting to the moon as a whole, uh, because craft would be able to dock with the space elevator instead of uh, having to soft land on the moon um, that reduced the launch cost for payloads you could you could use a uh, uh, much uh, lower uh, specific impulse engines like ion engines yeah. uh, to take craft to the top of the elevator and then and then land them down on the moon and um, and 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 out of this idea or out of these ideas you know what kind of um, what do you think the, the height or the altitude that these elevators could eventually uh, orbit or even uh, you know start off at. What is an optimal altitude that was sort of considered when thinking about uh, a potential beta test, which is very very exciting to to to, to hear. Uh, well, uh, as I've said, the 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 Earth space elevator would go up to geostationary orbit and a bit beyond, so um, thirty six thousand kilometers be on there for the apex anchor mars uh mars geostationary orbit or martian stationary orbit whatever you want to call it is only about thirteen thousand kilometers so you want to go just there and beyond uh however one of mars's moons deimos orbits at sixteen thousand uh kilometers so uh, you've got to worry about that uh and not colliding the anchor with the elevator um however on the moon uh, you'd want the space elevator going much further out than it would on the Earth. It would have to go up to fifty-six to 62,000 kilometres so that the space elevator would be uh, balanced at one the Lagrange points between uh, the Moon and the Earth. Um, so bigger, but uh, I suppose easier to build in a way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> we, we talk about easier to build, but when time comes, we'll see how easy it becomes depending <laughs> on how many, how many robotic new innovations that we start to develop, um, which is, which is, I'm guessing, and I'm, I'm assuming that will be the ones who will be building the space elevator, because I'm sure you don't want humans uh, in a position where uh, they're out to that Lagrange point without, without anything potentially. Um, you know, one, and or another one of these things that well, I wonder about it, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that you have some idea around is that uh, people engaged in the project, you know, how many people are, are con- currently part of ISEC and, you know, what can, uh, what can you say about new introductions taking place and new incomer- new incomers uh, that are coming on board the project and that are really, really hyped up about it and uh, essentially think that this is a, a woke idea. <laughs> I, uh, I think it's hard to say how many people are involved from my perspective, uh, having done an internship and volunteered for some research. I know that on the, the research I volunteer with, there are at least you know, 15 to 20 people participating. Um, so probably around that order of magnitude of people working with ISEC. But there are, there are organizations that collaborate with ISEC that um, you know, uh, work around the world. There's a uh, European organization dedicated to space elevators. There's a there's a Japanese space elevator association, uh, as well as uh, various companies who are or startups who are looking towards this kind of technologies, like Galactic Hardware Associates, 
um, who are all sort of walking, walking, working towards that kind of project. Uh, so, so I wonder, you know, in regards to that, uh, what kind of what what was the thing that surprised you the most um, and, and, uh, about this about this project when you started working on it, and what could you say that will continue to be a surprise to you uh, as as it starts to develop and as you start to bow out or look into different ideas and different perspectives? I think one of the surprising things is almost how far along uh, the research was to me at first glance. There's lots of discussion about how a space elevator isn't feasible or not possible and you know whether or not that's the case. Um, there's so much literature out there about getting it to work, about the material behind it, about the tethers, uh, about the, the physics of launching from a space elevator. And uh, there's there's plenty of research done. There's plenty more to do. Um, but in that regard, the, the space elevator is is making progress uh, in ways that I hadn't expected. Hey, that's good to know. I mean, at least that's a, that's a plus for the scientific community to think about the fact that uh, whether it's a novel concept or a concept that is uh, concurrent in any manner, um, it's still under development or it's still and the progress is significantly, you know, much, much uh, ahead than you out, you ought to imagine it to be. Um, and that kind of brings me up to my, 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 my new sort of idea as to how could you potentially think about a space elevator and have a similar concurrent concept that could be attached to it. You know, is it the only concept that is being thought about and being researched on that's related to uh, improving and creating efficiency and, um, and scientifically experimenting with, with, with uh, uh, projects uh, and innovative ideas like such? So I think, there are, there are a bunch of ideas surrounding uh, non-rocket launches, and there have been for quite a while. Um, you know, people wanting to avoid the rocket equation and, and get stuff into space more efficiently. Um, and as recently as, I think, you know, the early 2000s, we were seeing new ideas uh, going, going ahead and being published um, with quite some sort of uh, serious dedication. Um, even if you look all the way uh, back into concepts from ages ago there's stuff like the space gun um you know the, the u.s tried that with something called project heart uh, you know if we put something in a big gun and shoot it into space will that work uh, unfortunately um the uh, the problem with re-entry works both ways and that wasn't too successful uh so you could also look at something like a coil gun and magnetically accelerate payloads into space from the moon where you're not having to worry about the atmosphere um, something closely related to the space elevator that's received some attention is, is the sky hook. So instead of having a space elevator go all the way down, you, you might have uh, a space elevator that puts the tether midways so you can attach something at the bottom and take it up, launch it to the base of the elevator and then and then bring it to orbit. Uh, or, or even even more <laughs> more out there is a, a swinging sky hook. So a sky hook <laughs> that is constantly <laughs> rotating uh, about a point, and as the as the point rotates the surface of the Earth, you can attach a payload, and it will get swung up into orbit. You know, science fiction. There's no boundaries to science fiction, and no boundaries to imagination, as you can, you know, as you as you're telling us. And this is this is one of the most beautiful things about it, is that in science and in science fiction. Um, the line of realism or realistic standards versus actual doable things, it's, uh, it's getting thinner and thinner. Um, and I'm sure you're seeing that with the new concepts that are coming into, 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 into motion, into operation. And I'm sure in the next 30, 40 years, space elevators will be one of those concepts too. But one of the key things about any of these concepts is support and sponsorships. So, uh, is academia, private companies, uh, agencies involved? Are there funding surprises that our that our uh, listeners can tune into or research? Uh, well, the the prizes offered uh, by the NASA competitions, I think, are one good example of uh, incentives to get involved with this kind of thing. And I'd hope to see similar things in the future. 
Uh, ISEC itself has a number of sponsors. Uh, one example is Microsoft. Um, I'm not sure how much they give towards ISEC, but they are a sponsor. Uh, there's the Seattle Museum of Flight, Galactic Harbor, and a few other companies and groups here and there um, looking to getting the funding uh, dedicated. But I still think ultimately a, a lot of the time comes from the volunteering and the dedication of the people working uh, for ISEC and the people, the, especially the academics who are, are the most uh, knowledgeable on these kind of topics, uh, putting together um, huge studies and papers on space elevators. Um, so it would definitely be nice to see more support for that kind of uh, academia, but I think until you've got those business motives we talked about a bit earlier, uh, you're not going to see it in any sort of uh, you know, large capacity as you'd see at uh, other company research and development stages. Excellent. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to imagine is terrestrial applications are potentially figuring out a way to do a, um, uh, a beta of a space elevator instead of calling it a space elevator, calling it a very, very, uh, you know, altitude, a high altitude elevator or something. Um, is there, is there, is there a potential of something like this to happen and potentially upgrade it uh, to, to extend it to space and things like that? Um, so I don't think it would be uh, as possible to extend something from suborbital to orbital, um, but there's definitely a possibility to do lots of prototyping and tether testing uh, terrestrially without having to actually build a, a, an orbital space elevator. And that's one of the things I worked on during my internship with ISEC was looking at this balloon supported tether that I talked about when we were thinking about regulations. Um, and that would involve a, a balloon supporting a tether up to the middle of the stratosphere and, and testing tether dynamics and powering climbers uh, in that kind of way. Um, in terms of the actual space elevator, uh, the initial space elevator capability would be, would be relatively low, um, looking at carrying, I think, 14 tons a day. And then uh, along its sort of development timeline, the, the idea would be that each elevator could carry 79 tons a day. So uh, that kind of development is, is possible. You know, it's possible to get running before it's at full capability. Excellent. Well, Josh, I, I want to say that you've been in, uh, you've been a very great champion of uh, a space elevators this far, and I hope that you know in the future days um, we'll see your name attached to a uh, a potential of a space elevator under development. Um, but I've got I've got a I've got a few I've, I might have a few questions uh, that I'm sure that you can answer, and one of the questions is. Can we do the moon elevator within the next 10 years? I think the next 10 years is uh, a bit of a, a short timeline, considering that we don't plan on going back to the moon ourselves within the next three. Um, I think we've got uh, a lot of work to do developing any sort of lunar infrastructure before something of, of that uh, you know scale can be built, um, especially when you consider that you know, you'd need to have people staying on or, or working near the moon. Um, and, and NASA is very much in the early stages of even uh, looking at uh, that kind of that kind of infrastructure. I mean, we, we still don't have the final developments on the lunar landers uh, for the Artemis programs. So I think sustaining people uh, longer than the landers plan to sustain them for is, is going to be quite a way off still. But it will come because um, the Artemis program is, I think part of the motivation is working towards... Uh, building up the techniques and the technology for living longer term on Mars. Um, so it'll be there, but I'm not sure quite when. Uh, that's a great point. And because, because a lot of other things seem to get delayed due to political and geopolitical atmospheres and, um, you know, uh, uh, riots and insurrections all over the world, uh, essentially. Um, another question that just pops up is... Uh, could be the prototype uh, the prototype of Earth elevator first developed on Moon uh, or Mars. Is there a, is there a likely chance of that happening on board the on board the Artemis and and uh, potentially applying it that way? 
I think I'm not sure of the likelihood of it maybe being, uh, you know, developed first. I think it's very possible. Um, and I think if anything, the, the key there is that building one of these, you know, easier designs of a space elevator might might show that it's achievable, might show that there's a business case for it. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, provide those with the, the motivation to make the proof of concept um, work towards it. That's a, that's a great point. I think uh, the motivations have to be there and uh, the return on investment will have to be there before you start proving and applying some of these concepts that are very, very much out there. Um, what do you think that within the next 30 years, there'll be more progress um, in alternative non-rocket equation systems or within the elevator? Is it likely to happen with a, with a continuous sort of development and evolution that we're seeing in science that happens so rapidly? I think there'll certainly be progress and perhaps more research towards it. I, I don't know how likely it is um, that we'll see any sort of major developments or working towards building that infrastructure just because uh, the rocket industry is is so large. It's, it's growing. It's incredibly successful at the moment, and it's still got a long way to go. It's still got a lot of life in it um, before we hit those kind of limits. I think what might be the defining factor about when we strive for something like a space elevator or another non-rocket uh, uh, launching capability um, would be when we need these massive space projects. So if we see um, the acceleration of climate change and our planet move to a more catastrophic situation where we need something like uh, space-based solar power or we need um, to be constructing a sunshade at a Lagrange point or if we need to be disposing of nuclear waste into space, then there, there might be more of a, a hurried motivation there. Um, and the hurried motivation, you know, where where do you think that sort of pops up from in terms of what do you think about um, the the faster, cheaper, better type of scenario in space elevators or in anything, in any evolution? Uh, you know, there is a, there are those who are futurist and there are those who are uh, realists. <laughs> uh, so which one, which one do you see uh, leading the charge on innovations? I think currently the innovations are, are strongly based in that almost like realist view, um, especially looking at rocketry uh, and the way that's developing um, in terms of reusable vehicles. Not that reusable vehicles are themselves guaranteed to uh, be the absolute uh, end of future of space travel. I know that um, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, who are developing uh, the H3, the next uh, lead Japanese rocket, they're not particularly interested in looking at uh, reusable launch vehicles just yet. Um, and their, their rocket is going to rival the Falcon uh, 9 without needing... Uh, to be reused. Uh, SpaceX still struggle with refurbishing their rockets and the cost that uh, you know that, that takes them after after it's it's landed back on the pad. They still have to spend a lot of money getting it ready again to go back into space. Um, so I think I think a lot of that focus and that research is currently around that that realist idea of where can where can rockets be improved? Where can they be? Um, developed further and really sort of optimized so there are a lot of concepts here that need innovations to come into play before we actually think about putting a space elevator online so i think this is one of the things that brings up a point where uh we we, we try to figure out you know how much energy would be needed in order to put one kilogram of payload into uh, into into orbit with a space elevator I could, couldn't give you an exact number. Um, <laughs> not, the, not at the top of my head without doing some uh, some quick equations. And I guess I guess this is what we can do. We can we can translate that question to our listeners. You know, if you figure out uh, this the, the the answer to this problem, uh, share it with us. Uh, but I've got one last question with you. I've I've got one last question for you, Josh. You know, if you could take an object. Uh, 
by using a space elevator uh, to space, uh, what would it be and why would it be that object? Take it up with space elevator. Uh, well, maybe a lead blanket so that I don't get irradiated while I'm going up there. Um. <laughs> 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 That's definitely a good point, and you know this is a question that we're hoping to wrap up all of our all of our uh, shows with. Is why do you think space should continue to move forward? I think space should continue to move forward uh, because if we don't uh, seek to move forward in these sort of ways and uh, aspire to projects and goals that at first seem like they're at the fringes of our imagination. Uh, then you can't really sort of take that that first step to something that seems more realistic. It, it sets those long-term goals uh, that allow you to make progress and uh, also um, allows you to make smaller steps along the way. Well, um, Josh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and, uh, and for being the inaugural guest on Space Forward Podcast. My pleasure. Um, thank you so much for being here and we truly appreciate the time that you've taken and, and all the all the essence of space elevators and information that you've shared with us um, thank you so much yeah thank you very much it was an absolute pleasure thanks for listening to this episode stay tuned for more topics we have in store for you follow us on Spotify subscribe on Apple Podcast hear you next time Ciao.